Hello, AP Government Students. This is Unit 6 FRQ Review. Um, I just want to tell you uh, what you need to have on your responses so that you can get full credit on each question. Make sure that you're very thorough and make sure that you connect the, the answer back to the question. So let's go to number one. Describe two ways interest groups can affect elections. So interest groups can affect election through a strategy called electioneering. And electioneering is basically an interest group helping a candidate that might be sympathetic to the cause get elected into office in hopes that if he gets elected, he will make policy or help them create policy that would benefit the interest group. So they can affect elections in many different ways through electioneering. Number one, they can um, endorse a candidate. Um, they can tell their members this is the candidate to vote for. They can tell their supporters, if you support our cause, this is the person that you should vote for. Um, number two, they can give them funds through the use of PACs. They can raise money and they can spend that money through the use of PACs. Um, they can also inform voters about that particular candidate and his opponents, why we should vote for the candidate and why we shouldn't vote for his opponent. Um, they can go around and um, tell their supporters to go ahead and vote during an election time and vote for this person. So there's many different ways interest groups can um, use the resources that they have and utilize them to get someone elected and affect elections. They can also buy ads, for example. Number two, describe two roles political parties play during election time. So one of the roles political parties play during election time, and it's an important role, is they're the ones that nominate the candidates that are going to be running for elections. So they do that through primaries and through caucuses. Um, they're the ones to select who's going to be the nominees for each party and who's going to be participating in the, in the elections. Um, they also inform voters about particular candidates, especially their candidate, because they want to help their candidate win. So they go around, they, do, they go through their website, they, they go around people, um, neighborhoods, cities, to inform voters about their candidates and why they should vote for their members to, go, to get into government. Um, they can also fundraise for their candidates and help them financially to get elected. They also give voters cues during election. They give us little clues on who we should vote for depending on their party designation. So voters assume that Republicans are conservatives and, Democrat, uh, and voters assume Democrats are liberals and they can make a somewhat informed decision uh, by using those party cues, those party labels. Number three. Give a reason for the establishment of the Electoral College system. So the reason why the Electoral College system um, was established is our founding fathers did not want have to, us to have direct influence on who becomes the President of the United States. We have some influence, but in reality, it is the Electoral College that decides who's going to be the next President of the United States. They wanted to keep that out of the majority's hands because they didn't feel like the majority will be informed enough to make that, to make that decision directly. Um, they didn't feel like that we have um, enough expertise to be able to do that. And in case we chose somebody that's wrong for the country, the Electoral College can go ahead and stop that from happening. So give two reasons why the Electoral College has not been abolished. So even though a lot of people are disagree with the Electoral College system, a lot of people want to get rid of it, it still remained with us in the United States today for 200 years because of the following reasons. Number one, it's part of our history, it's part of our tradition. It's been there since the Constitution has been written. Um, it's something that's um, one of the most unique things about American presidential elections is that we have the Electoral College system. Number two, if we wanted to change the Electoral College system, we had to amend the Constitution, which is a very, very difficult thing to do. Um, number three, um, during close elections, because of the Electoral College system, sometimes, sometimes small states matter. Um, number four, if we didn't have the electoral college system and we just had a straight up and down votes and we counted the number of votes and whoever got the most votes won, what's gonna what's gonna happen is candidates would focus on um, areas in which population is concentrated so that they can get as much votes as they can. So they would focus on big cities like Los Angeles and New York because they know if they focus their resources in those big cities, they might have a chance of winning. So what's going to tend to happen is candidates will ignore the wants and the needs and the concerns of rural areas, areas that are not densely populated, like, for example, the Rio Grande Valley. We're going to be ignored during election time. Uh, while these big uh, cities, the, the areas where population is concentrated, those are going to be the ones that candidates pay attention to. All right, number four. Describe three policies that expanded suffrage in the United States. 
Um, so this, you can put a lot of things. Um, you could put, for example, the 15th Amendment, which gave anybody that was born here, all males that was born here, um, the eligibility to be able to vote. All citizens in the United States, regardless of color, as long as you're male, and for the 15th Amendment, is now able to vote. The 19th Amendment gave women suffrage. So make sure that not only do you list the policies, the list the amendments or list the, the laws, make sure you describe what they did to increase um, suffrage in the United States. So you can put 15th Amendment, you can put the 19th Amendment, you can vote, put the Voting Rights Act of 1965, which made, it, made all the procedures that made it harder for African Americans and other minorities to vote illegal. You can also put the 24th Amendment, which banned poll taxes. So anything that um, expanded suffrage, expanded the right to vote in the United States, um, you, is eligible for this particular question. Number five, explain how each of the following affect um, voter turnout. So three things you need to do here. You need to tell me what each one does. Um, you need to tell me if it increased and or decreased voter turnout, and you need to tell me why. So for example, the Voting Rights Act of 1965, um, it's a law that eliminated all barriers that would, but that would make it more difficult for African American and minorities to vote. And that increased voter turnout um, because it, it eliminated those barriers that would prevent an African American or a minority from voting. Uh, motor voter laws, uh, motor, the Motor Voter Act passed in the 1990s um, allowed voters to register to vote on, at the same time they are applying or renewing their driver's license, which made it more convenient to vote, oh, I'm sorry, made it more convenient to register to vote, which um, increased voter turnout in the United States because registration became more convenient. Number three, same day registration. Same day registration allows voters to register on the same day as when they're going to vote. So they don't have to take time um, two days out of their lives to register and then go vote uh, another day, they can knock it, dock both things down at the same day, which makes um, registration and voting more convenient because you're doing them at the same time, which increases voter turnout because, again, it made it easier to register and to vote. Um, number four, registration requirement. Um, in a lot of states, before you're able to vote, you need to register uh, to be able to vote. If you're not registered, they're not going to let you vote. This made it inconvenient to vote because before you can vote, you need to take another day out of, out of, another, another day of, out, out of your life to go ahead and register, which is inconvenient for a lot of people. And a lot of people, especially poor people, um, college students, minorities, um, they may not see that as a priority so that they're not able to register and not able to vote. So again, registration requirements. Some states um, made it make it a requirement for someone to register before he's able to vote, making the voting process more inconvenient, lowering voter turnout. Photo ID laws. In some states, you are required to present a photo ID before you are able to vote. This made it more inconvenient for people to vote, thus lowering voter turnout. So in some states, you need to present yourself a valid photo identification before you're able to vote. Um, that makes it inconvenient because some people don't have photo IDs, some people don't have the means or the time to go ahead and go out and get a photo ID so that they can vote. This lowers voter turnout drastically in the states that have photo ID laws. All right, what is the message of the cartoon above? So the message of the cartoon above is during presidential elections, make sure you read every part. Whenever you see a stimulus-based question, read every part of it, especially the title. So the title says, Map of the United States as viewed by the presidential candidates. So, the, so obviously the message of this cartoon is, during presidential election, candidates feel that some states are more important than others, that some states um, require their attention and their resources more than others. And obviously those are the swing states um, that they can influence so that they can vote for them or vote for the other person. We don't know which party are these states are going to go every single election. But again, the answer to that one is during presidential elections, candidates see states differently. They view some states, especially swing states, more important than other states. 
make sure you define what a swing state is also. States that can go either way every single election. Uh, the next question is, explain why California, Texas, New York are not exaggerated in the cartoon above, like Florida, Virginia, and Ohio. It's because these states are what we call safe states. Um, they're not exaggerated because safe states are not deemed important by candidates because we know um, which way are they going to go every single election. It is not enough to just say um, because they are safe states. You need to explain why they're not exaggerated because for candidates, safe states are not important because safe states, um, these have so, so, so much overwhelming support for one particular candidate of a party that we know the result of that election. We know where the electoral votes will go for that state. Number seven, describe how the following affects the person's likelihood of voting. Um, the older you are, the more likely you are to vote. The more educated you are, the more likely you are to vote. Those are very easy. Number eight, explain how the McGovern Fraser Commission made the delegate selection process more democratic and open and how it limited the power of party leaders. Before the McGovern Fraser Commission in 1968, the delegates that are sent by state parties to the national convention were chosen by the party leaders of a state. So the party leaders controlled uh, which delegates are going to be sent to the national convention, which gave them the ability to control who's going to be the nominee, the presidential nominee for the party. So party leaders and the party establishment were the ones that decided which delegates are going to be sent from their state to the national convention, uh, which ultimately decided who's going to be the nominee. They had a lot of power. But the mcgovern Fraser Commission changed all that. The mcgovern Fraser Commission allowed people a voice on which delegates are going to be sent to the national convention through direct primaries and through direct caucuses. We now, party members and other people, now have a voice on um, who's going, which delegates are going to be sent by their state party to the national convention. And party leaders influence um, on the nomination process decrease because of this. Because party leaders no longer have the uh, only say on which delegates are going to be sent to the national convention. Number nine, how does FICA limit the influence of interest groups and others on the election process. Um, and number 10, they, they kind of go hand in hand, identify at least two limitations that FICA impose on campaign spending on contributions. So how does FICA limit contributions? How does it limit the influence of money in our election? Um, so there's many different approaches you can answer this. Number one, um, FICA created a public fund for presidential candidates that don't want to beg rich and wealthy um, people for money. Instead, they can ask the government for some funds so that they can conduct their campaigns. So there's public funds for presidential candidates now. Um, number two, FICA created the FEC. The FEC is a government agency, the Federal Election Commission. It's a government agency that enforces and regulate election. They enforce campaign laws and they, they um, regulate um, our elections, our election campaigns and finances. Um, also, FICA limited individual contributions to a candidate to $2,700. FICA also limited um, PAC contributions to $5,000. So there's a limit on how much money individuals and PACs can, can give or contribute to a candidate. And lastly, FICA required that all candidates have to account meticulously account for every single cent that was given to them. They need to tell the FEC who gave it to them and how much money was given to them. So that's FICA, Federal Election Campaign Act. So that answers nine and 10. Number 11, describe the winner takes all feature of the electoral college system. In 48 out of the 50 states, they use the winner takes all system. What that means is if you get the most votes, notice I didn't say majority vote, if you get the most votes in a state, you win all of that state's electoral votes. So if Donald Trump gets more votes than Hillary Clinton and other candidates um, in Texas, for example, then Donald Trump gets Texas's 38 electoral votes, all of it. And the losers, no matter how badly they lost, get nothing. Even if they lost by one or two percentages, as long as they didn't get the most votes, they get nothing. The winner is the one that gets all of that state's electoral votes. 
explain how the winner takes all feature affects the way presidential candidates run their campaigns. So, because most states are winner takes all, candidates have to be very careful in which states they spend time and money on. So they usually go spend their resources on larger states, states that are gonna yield them um, a lot of electoral votes be because they don't wanna waste their resources on states that don't have a lot of electoral votes, they're gonna focus those resources on larger states with a ton of electoral votes. Not only any, not just any larger, large states, they have to focus on larger swing states like Ohio and Florida and Virginia um, because in most of the states in the union that are safe states, we know which way they're gonna go. Spending resources in those states is a waste of time and resources. Um, so instead, because of the winner takes all system, candidates are forced uh, or are compelled to focus on larger swing states, states that can go either way every single election. Because they know if they win, even if it's only by 1% or 2%, as long as they get the most votes more than any other candidate in that state, they get all of that state's electoral votes. So they focus on larger swing states because of the winner takes all system. Number three, explain how it hinders third party candidates from getting electoral votes. Third party candidates during presidential elections get a lot of votes. They get millions of votes sometimes. The Green Party got millions of votes in 2016. However, um, since it's a winner takes all system, if they do not get the most votes, if they do not manage to beat the other candidates in that particular state, then they get nothing. And that's the case for most third party candidates. They don't have overwhelming support in, or for a particular candidate. Instead, they lose, and when they lose, they get nothing. Number 12, explain how each of the following practices and why they exist. Um, front loading, Super Tuesday, and Super Delegates. Front loading is a practice by some states to make their primaries and caucus dates earlier in the calendar year. Um, sometimes in February, sometimes in March, they want to make their primaries and caucuses earlier and earlier. Why? Because there's a ton of attention paid to um, early contests by the media, by the public, and by the candidates. The candidates want to um, want to make it seem like, want to put out the perception that they are doing really well, that their campaign has momentum. So they focus a lot on these early states because they know the results of these early elections, the results of these early primaries and caucuses um, can mean more supporters can mean more attention given to them, more donors um, that are flocking to them. So again, front loading. Front loading is a practice of states that, uh, to make their primaries and caucuses earlier, around February and March. They do this because they know candidates pay attention to early contests. Candidates, the media, the American public, they like to pay attention to the earlier contests. Number two, Super Tuesday. Um, this is an alliance between states to conduct their primaries and caucuses on the same day. They do this because they, there's a lot of delegates up for grab during that day, which forces the media, the candidates, and the American public to focus on those states participating in Super Tuesday. So again, Super Tuesday is an alliance between states to conduct their primaries and caucuses on the same day. Super Tuesday exists so that these states participating in Super Tuesday can take advantage of the attention given to them by the candidates and by the media and by the American public because so many delegates are up for grabs during Super Tuesday. Super delegates only exist in the Democratic Party. Super delegates do not represent a state. Instead, they represent the best interests of the Democratic Party. Um, they are super in a way that they do not have to abide by any primary or caucus results. These delegates can vote for whoever they want regardless of any primary results or caucus results. So they can vote for, if they're not pledged to any candidate, they can vote for any candidate that they want. Super delegates are usually party VIPs like current holders of office, current congressmen, former presidents, party VIPs. And again, super delegates exist um, to give um, some power to the party leaders 
um, when it comes to the nomination process to make sure that people who are not good for the party are not nominated um, as their presidential candidate. So to review, superdelegates are, um, are delegates that are unpledged. They can vote for whoever they want. They represent the best interests of the Democratic Party. They exist to make sure that people who are not um, who are not good for the party do not get the presidential nomination. Um, they exist to make sure or to give some power back to the party leaders and the party establishment that they lost because of the McGovern Fraser Commission. Describe three criticisms of American election system. So there's a lot of criticisms about our election system. Number one, the primaries and the caucuses they make elections longer. Instead of just worrying about the real election, we also have to worry about the party nominations, the party nomination contests, the primaries and caucuses, it just makes the whole thing long. Um, which means it's more expensive, which gives more power to the rich people in the United States. Um, number two, during primaries and caucuses, not a lot of people participate. We have low turnout in the primaries and caucuses, and in the real election as well, we have very, very low turnout. In primaries and caucuses, the people that show up are not representative of the American voter. A lot of them are very ideological, a lot of them are very partisan, uh, which in turn uh, means that a lot of these people that get nominated are also partisan, are also very ideological. Um, people criticize our electoral college system. They think that it's undemocratic, that pe sometimes people that don't deserve to win, that don't get the most popular votes, wins the election anyway, becomes president anyway, because we're using such an archaic system. A lot of people don't agree with the Democratic Party's um, superdelegate system. They think it's undemocratic. They think it's elitist, because it gives a lot of power back to the party leaders and the party establishment when it comes to choosing who's going to be the next Democratic nominee for president. So there's many different things that you can put in here. There's many different things that are wrong with our election system, especially you can also put um, money has too much influence in our election because there's just too many loopholes in our election laws. All right, 14, how do campaign strategies of presidential candidates differ from primaries and general election? During primaries, like I told you before, voters are usually very passionate about their party. They're usually partisan and ideological. And as a result, candidates have to appeal to those. They have to be more ideological, they have to be more partisan during primary elections because those are the type of voters they're trying to attract and go ahead and vote for them. But um, as the general elections get nearer, um, the people that vote in the general elections, general elections, the real elections are usually decided by independents. They're usually decided by moderates. So what candidates have to do is they have to move from the extreme left or the extreme right and they have to move to the center. They have to be more moderate. They have to be more centrist uh, in the policies that they're advocating or at least appear to be more moderate, appear to be centrist so that they can attract the independents and the moderates of the United States, the ones that usually decide um, who wins an election. All right. Number 15, explain two features of our election system that put third party candidates at a disadvantage. So I gave you two. The winner takes all system, not just in the presidential elections, but also in other elections. Most of our elections are winner takes all. Um, they, they put third parties at a disadvantage. Because even though third party candidates get some votes, um, the fact that they're not as popular as the other two parties means that they're probably not going to get the most votes. And if they don't get the most votes, if they don't get to win, they get nothing. Because in the United States, most of our elections are winner takes all. Um, number two, the single district system, plurality system in the United States, um, especially for the House of Representatives, where candidates from every party have to compete for just one seat. Um, third parties are put at a disadvantage because it's hard for them to beat um, the Democratic candidate or the, Demo or the Republican candidate for that one single seat. So all the parties are fighting for one single seat and the popular parties, the Republicans and the Democrats, are probably the, are gonna be the ones that win most of the time. If you have any questions on these, make sure to let me know. There's always Remind 101 if you wanna contact me. Um, you can also come in the morning or during lunch and have me check your responses to make sure that they're adequate, so make sure that they're good enough. 
um, for your tests. Um, just so that I can encourage you to watch these videos, the first one who clucks like a chicken during the test while we're taking the test, I'll give you five points on your FRQ. All right, thank you for watching.